From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Sometimes we all need to ask for advice. For example, I'm constantly texting my home theater guru, Nathan Lodato, about whether it's finally time to upgrade to the new Bravia XR Z9J 8K HDR television from Sony. And that's NYSC ticker symbol S-O-N-Y. Having a trusted expert on retainer, or at least on speed dial, puts you at ease and reinforces that you're making the right choice. And from time to time, businesses need advice too. They turn to consultants, firms like Bain, Boston Consulting Group, who provide an external voice to understand the problem you're facing and help improve organizational effectiveness. Reliance on external analysis and advice has always played a critical role in helping even the biggest organizations retool and reimagine their product set. BCG's website, for example, has this great case study of how Bed Bath & Beyond's new CEO, Mark Tritton, pivoted amid the pandemic to preserve liquidity and reduce debt, shrinking his physical footprint by permanently closing 200 stores and accelerating the company's move from multi-channel to omni-channel distribution. But beyond the big players in the consulting world, there's this wide range of smaller consultants who focus on specialized aspects of the management challenge. And here's where it really gets interesting. One such firm, Red Associates, a boutique shop with offices in New York and Denmark, argues that the traditional strategy tools really need to be amped up with other skills, combining anthropological, sociological, and ethnographic research to help its clients develop a new perspective and strategy for their businesses. The managing partner in charge of RED and the woman who oversees its fast-growing financial services, insurance, and healthcare practices is Millie Aurora. She runs the firm's day-to-day operations as the group has expanded and helped clients achieve organizational effectiveness. Over the nearly 300 episodes of this show, we've talked to founders, CEOs, CFOs, regulators, investors, attorneys, board members, marketers, advertisers, and just about every other expert in the industrial ecosystem. But for our first foray into the world of management consulting, our conversation with Millie Aurora is coming up right after this. The transition to electronic trading is gaining support in fixed income markets, presenting opportunity and driving demand for data. At ICE, we're a leading provider for fixed income data and analytics. We offer a comprehensive fixed income execution solution via ICE Bonds, committed to execution quality, transparency, and information. We provide a wide range of platforms with deep liquidity pools that support multiple trading protocols. Our fixed income indices can be tailored to your investment strategy, powered by our data. Our ESG data offers increased transparency into fixed income markets. Access the ICE fixed income ecosystem, including the ICE bonds execution platforms, evaluated pricing and analytics via ICE fixed income select. By creating a single point of access for our execution platforms, customers can utilize a variety of trading protocols and manage risk. ICE supports your end-to-end fixed income workflow, increasing transparency, execution efficiency, and data access across the fixed income marketplace. Our guest today, Millie Aurora, is managing partner of Red Associates and oversees the strategic direction of the firm globally. She also drives Red's practice in financial services, insurance, and healthcare in the U.S. And prior to her nine years at Red, Millie served as assistant vice president of strategic planning for New York City's Economic Development Corporation, the KIPP Foundation, and the consulting firm LECG after getting her degrees 
from Cal Berkeley and her master's in economics and public policy from Princeton. Welcome, Millie, inside the Ice House. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So Princeton has long been seen as an assembly line for management consultants. And in fact, you were co-chair of its graduate consulting group. Did you always see that as your career path? You know, funny enough, I didn't. I started my career in consulting, as you rightfully stated, at an economics consulting group where I spent long days trying to measure the consumer harm and or benefits of major mergers and acquisitions happening at the time, PeopleSoft Oracle. You might imagine uh, cases against Apple iTunes and Napster at the time. And it felt too abstract for me being in the world of consulting, to be honest. And that's where I pivoted and I went into the world of education research because I really wanted to have an impact with people on the ground. I went into policy school and Princeton, as you mentioned, the Woodrow Wilson School there, trying to really understand what are the underlying drivers of the economic system, of different networks that interact with that system, nonprofits, government, local institutions, to figure out how we could come together to effectuate change in the world. As part of my time with the graduate consulting group, I did a really fun project with the city of Newark, trying to think about their sustainability efforts at the time. They've got a massive port, has a lot of sustainability issues with that port, not only in terms of air quality and so on. And there, you know, what I really enjoyed in the world of consulting is thinking at a systems level about how to effectuate change. But I always thought I'd take that back to sort of the grassroots local level. So it's funny that you asked that question now, almost 15 years later after my graduate degree, that I'm back in the world of consulting. And I think it's because it allowed the world of consulting allows you to sort of step back and reflect of all the different pieces that need to come together to solve really complex and critical issues. How did you find your way to Berkeley in the first place in the beginning of that trajectory that ultimately led to this career you've got? So when I got to Berkeley, my eyes were opened and I was really drawn to the field of economics and in particularly development economics because it was a field in which, yes, there were theories and ways in which you could explain how growth was experienced in countries and particularly development countries. Yet at the same time, there was a burgeoning field of trying to understand root causes and root drivers that could be explained by economic models. So I had an, an amazing mentor, thesis advisor, Ted Miguel, who's gone on to, to write numerous books in the field of development and economics that tried to understand sort of those root causes of why kids don't show up to school and how can we start spending time with people in the field and bringing that data into economic models to help drive policy change. And that really was sort of the catalyst for me and the work I do even now at Red. We touched briefly on it during the introduction, but I think it would be helpful to hear directly from you. Who, what exactly is Red Associates and what's the story behind this Danish New York based consulting practice? Yes. So Red is a social science strategy consulting firm. And a lot of people confuse that with social sciences. It's just about understanding people or organizational change. But really, we are a boutique firm that is all about understanding the social and cultural forces that shape human behavior, that shape why we all do the things that we do, and bring that understanding into the heart of business decision making. So whether it's advising our clients like Samsung on the its future product roadmap or service definition, or thinking about large firms trying to think about the intersection of social and moral issues such as sustainability and business. A lot of our clients turn to us for some of these big existential, existential fundamental issues facing future strategy, future product definition, how they should engage with the customers, how they can rebuild that trust with customers. And We use the tools of the social sciences. Now, I have an economics background, but many people here at Red have an anthropology background. Art history, philosophy, sociology, really, it's a myriad of different types of people that share a common interest in understanding people and culture and using that to advise CEOs and CMOs and major strategists in a lot of our firms. What's the Copenhagen angle? The Copenhagen Angles, our founders are from Copenhagen. So we got our footing 15, 16 years ago by a philosopher, economist, sociologist 
who back then it wasn't popular to really do this. Human centricity, customer centricity, understanding people really wasn't lexicon that was inside the world of business. Traditional management science reigned the day. Everything had to be measured, put into a spreadsheet. The way of reasoning inside of companies was abductively, right? So you have a set of hypotheses, you test those, you figure out what's the way to, to grow your greatest market share, and that's how you big business bets. People were in some ways were taught to sort of forget, even if you came from a social science background, forget all of that stuff. Really here, it was about the hard sciences. And really the philosophy was, is that really true? Aren't companies really at the service of customers ultimately? And shouldn't there be a space for the humanities in big business decisions? So that was the premise. And a lot of our early clients were Danish clients and, and continue, continue to be. So Lego is one of the flagship cases that you know many people who've heard of Red have heard about our work with Lego over the years. We started working with them early days back in the 2000s when the company was at the brink of bankruptcy because they were running the company based on this management science logic, chasing trends, the trends of digitization of games. Nintendo was introducing danger into all sorts of play and the electronification of game gaming, basically. And, and Lego was trying to chase those from a design standpoint, launching new products monthly, burning cash, and really not having a North Star about what play was really about. And we've been working with them ever since. Back then, we, we helped them sort of rethink what play is all about and, and bringing in the ideas of play is really about hierarchy and mastery. One of the classic examples we always talk about is a young boy named Luca who we met in Los Angeles and we were meeting with him, his parents and out on the play, playground on the skate park. And when we asked him what his greatest, most prized possession was, he pulled out and rummaged through his closet an old worn out shoe. And when we asked him why, it was because particular skid marks, and I wish I had the picture to show, show your listeners, were a sign for him and his friends that he had perfected the perfect way to do a certain backflip, kickflip on a skateboard. And to him, that was that was his most prized possession. That is sort of why he loved skateboarding. And that to us signaled that, you know, what kids want is not all the sort of danger and so on. You know, some of that can sort of lure kids in, but really mastery, a sense of hierarchy, a sense of skill building as you play is what kids were really looking for in play at that time. And that really reoriented Lego to sort of refocus back on the brick, which is, if you think about it, such a, a core tenant of how you can build worlds and bit stories and build hierarchy in, in play experiences. So that's the story of Denmark. It continues to be a major hub for us. We have an office in Denmark, an office in New York, and continue to sort of do great work cross-Atlantically. I mentioned the Bain and Boston Consulting Group in the intro, and you can imagine what, you know, all the deep papers and thought leadership that you can find on, on those websites. You spend any time on the Red Associates website, you're greeted by some lovely black and white photography of hands molding a chunk of clay on a potter's wheel. And it says, it's important that we keep the technology in the background to ensure our hands and humans can learn, collaborate, and shine on their own. Why, Millie, are hands so important? Because hands are people too. I mean, I think when you think about technology as fundamentally changing how we as human be beings operate with each other, the social structures around us, and as if you're a major technology company that's thinking about the future of AR and VR and thinking about devices, whether that's smart devices in the home or devices for your hands or gloves or the future of displays in the home, if at home in the workplace, if you're thinking about workplace or the future of work, you need to understand the way in which our bodies are a part of us, how when we cook, for example, there are things that are we are doing with our hands that we aren't even aware of, that have just become habitus for us. And any technologist needs to recognize that those are intuitive behaviors that are part of what put us into flow movements. And we think it's important that when we think about designing new products, designing new services, designing new technology, that you take into account us as human beings in totality, and that includes our hands. It includes about how we use those hands as a movement of expression. And I think 
if you were designing technology without understanding the role of the body, the role of the body in communication to others, I think you're doomed to fail. Red relies on this differentiated set of expertise when you work with your clients like them. Millie, you hire PhD students in anthropology, history, journalism, political science, and tend to steer away from your typical MBA candidate in maybe finance or accounting or economics. Where are you finding the best talent and what's their background when you they come in your door? The common thread in people who we hire are people who are able to listen well, who have a deep empathy and curiosity in people, and who are really detail-oriented, in particular in sort of the skills of observation. Being able to just sit back, observe, listen without rushing to judgment. And now that tends to, those are the kinds of skills that you're trained or theories you are trained in if you studied anthropology or philosophy and so on. Those are the kinds of questions you grapple with often. But I would say, you know, there's not a particular school or set of schools that we look to. It's really those that have showcased that curiosity in their life experience. People who have gone off to do a research project for a year because it was a passion of theirs. People who've taken a risk to really dive deep into the world of shoemaking because that is just something that they were really fascinated with and wanted to learn and understand everything there was about that. Those are the kinds of people that we are interested in hiring. And you know, the reason why we don't tend to hire from business schools is because we find that typically business school tends to reinforce a hypothesis-driven problem-solving approach where let's think about three potential solutions to a problem and let's go test that. As opposed to having a beginner's mind, being able to look at the world and absorb data that's coming at you to create new solutions. So let's set the scene. You're meeting with that client for the first time and they've asked for some help from Red to to build a product roadmap. What does the process typically look like and what questions are then you and your colleagues asking when you're starting to assess whether you're gonna take on a project and begin the work? So typically our clients come to us with a traditional business problem. Uh, You take the class I'll talk about, Samsung, who for many years has come to us thinking about, we want to design or think about the next wave of TVs in the home, for example. An interesting question. There's a lot of innovation that's happening and it's a very competitive space. And we'll say, well, what are the fundamental underlying human questions that will shape where the home electronic market is gonna go for the next decade. And there's a lot of things that are changing today. If, if someone were to come ask me that question today, um, you know, amidst the pandemic, you have many people thinking about where they wanna live. What does, what does a home mean to you today? The mass exodus from major cities like New York City, which we're both in, to suburbia, to more time being spent at home and people reconfiguring Where do families hang out? What's the role of the office? How do we make more space? What we'll do with a client is think about what are those human questions? What we, what do, and that gives us a question to study, a human question to study. We want to understand changing home dynamics. We want to understand the impact of how people are thinking about their life careers and how they're thinking about where they want to be and what is ultimately the impact of home entertainment. We want to think about how people are thinking about migration, perhaps, and communication with family members across, because we know that TVs no longer are just entertainment devices, but they compete for attention in terms of communication and devices and so on. So we go in and frame those human questions. And then we do some tactical stuff about, well, we want to understand this in X markets because that's where the biggest market potential is. So we'll go out and study people in their homes understand their communication practices, understand their work practices, understand family dynamics in the home and who actually drives decision-making about how a home is laid out. What's the role of between a mother and a father and their children? Who's negotiating the rules about what gets used and what gets placed where? And we'll go out and study. Our team of researchers who we've hired will go out and spend time with people in their homes for days, if not weeks, to really 
observe again. I mean, you certainly have in your own life a interesting range of worlds and homes and communities that you've seen. This kid who grew up in Fullerton, California, you joined Red in 2013 as its COO after three years of service in the New York City Economic Development Corporation, height of the Mike Bloomberg years in New York. What did you take away from that New York City experience and why did you decide that that was the time to move into red and this sort of idea of consulting versus the one earlier in your career? To take the first part of that question, what did I learn from my time with under the Bloomberg administration? What I took away from that experience is the power of local government and the power of local communities to effectuate change. You know, I joined the Bloomberg administration post the 2008 financial crisis right here where we're sitting. And it was a tough time. There was a lot of talent that was leaving the city, a lot of tax dollars was leaving the city, a lot of empty real estate. There was a question about what does the longevity of the New York City economy look like? How can we retain talent? How can we diversify the New York City tax base away just from financial services? How can we keep talent here and retrain them to the the world of tech? And we got to do a lot of amazing, amazing initiatives that I think have long-term impact. Red's offices is now in the same building where the Cornell Technion campus has its offices. And that was one of the major initiatives we got off the ground in terms of soliciting a competition between universities to really think about how to make New York City a hub for tech talent to compete against Silicon Valley. And I think that experience, again, for me personally, talked to the power of local communities and the importance of communities engaging in driving change, you know, whether that's school boards or so on. And that's something I carry with me constantly. I'll say when I came to Red and when I first heard about Red, sort of my spark plugs went off that this approach and and we're starting to do a bit more of it now, I felt is deeply needed in the world of policymaking. Oftentimes, when policy gets made, it's a lot of smart politicians, smart economists, and so on that have amazingly great ideas. Bring, you know, we brought together VCs and so on to sort of conceptualize big ideas when we were thinking about some of the, the things we did post-crisis. But at the same time, the concepts of sort of participatory budgeting, really understanding all stakeholders from the grassroots level up wasn't really being heard in policymaking. And read to me signaled an approach that yes, of course, is deeply valued in corporations today, but is also deeply needed in the world of policymaking, in the world of social impact. And it's been fun to see that over the last couple of years, these worlds have really started to merge. And even at Red, we've been trying to do, and we have been doing a lot more world with, a lot more work with companies to think about what are ways you can bring the social impact and marry that with the commercial impact and doing that in an authentic way. I know you've written a lot about financial literacy, and I'm curious, you know, how you define that and how that fits into some of the other aspects of RED that we've been talking about. I'm struggling a little bit to see how they go hand in hand. I think one of the core issues that come across all of our studies in the world of financial services is people's relationship to money is, is broken, You know, Melody Hobson, who's board of Starbucks, wrote an amazing op-ed for anyone who hasn't read it over the weekend um, in the Financial Times. And she highlighted the sort of the heart of the crisis, right? Money isn't something we talk about. And that issue of people's relationship, that the fears that are ingrained in people's relationship to money create all sorts of challenges. And literacy is one of them. I think, talk about, you know, we've done a lot of studies with average everyday Americans around that broken relationship to money. We've done studies with immigrant populations in the U.S. and in Europe. And many, many people have this fear of messing up. If you're an immigrant in this country and you've, you know, a young woman that we met in Texas, her father had lost his job twice and you know, instilled in her, I do not want you to go into credit card debt. I had to do it because I lost my job. I just want stability, safety, and security for you. The consequences of that is she is deeply averse to credit card debt. She will put every ounce of earnings she makes into a savings account, but is is afraid to take out credit and is also deeply afraid of investing in the stock market 
or investing her money whatsoever because the rules of the system are opaque to her. She doesn't understand them. They don't make sense. No one has really broken down for her investing 101, nor has she grown up in, a, in an environment that sort of gave her that intuitive sense of knowledge for how to invest and how to make your money work for you. And so when I say literacy, I don't necessarily mean teaching of financial concepts. It's how can we better train and build the intuition in people so that they get comfortable investing. They get comfortable prioritizing long-term savings over short-term savings when it makes sense. And that's really at the core of a lot of our work at Red, whether we studied the issue of people's relationship to money with kids or teachers or average everyday folks, there's this lack of financial intuition and therefore a fear that people will just get it wrong. You've written about the difference, I think, between what you call fast money and slow money. Can you explain what you mean by those concepts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think this stems from a lot of our work with a lot of banks who, you know, for many years have been focusing on how can we digitize money? How can we make things more seamless, more convenient, ready at hand, make payments faster and, and all of those sorts of things. And what we found is those kinds of things are really important for fast money, things that are here and now. Again, things like your checking account, bill, billing account, the pandemic clearly showcased that people are comfortable with not visiting a bank, a bank branch and doing a lot of sort of day-to-day -day financial matters digitally. But when it comes to slow money, in our view, that's money oriented to the future. Things like investing, things like your pension, your retirement savings, life insurance, all of those things that are oriented to the future, people are a little bit lost. They seek safety, they seek stability, they seek peace of mind, but they really struggle with how to connect decisions I'm making now with my fast money, with how that's going to impact and connect to my slow money decisions. And why that's important is because we think when you design financial products or ways to, to provide financial advice, really sort of the design principles around that are, are quite different. With fast money, yes, those need to be digital, they need to be safe, they need to be secure, they need to be ready at hand and fast. All of those things really matter. But when it comes to slow money, that's actually where people, going back to this financial literacy point and intuition, it's where people need to slow down a bit. They need to understand the steps piece by piece. If you think back to the, the, the mortgage crisis and the housing crisis, a lot of people signed up for a mortgage. It was easy, it was fast. They were able to get fast money. It wasn't until things fell apart that they understood the consequences of what they had done. Yeah, it felt embodied that experience of what it means to really sign up for something. And so we often argue that for slow money, you need to, again, introduce friction. And we saw a lot of people doing this, you know, having their own hacks, putting a credit card up on the top shelf so they wouldn't want to spend money or actually being happy that they forgot their password to the account that has their rainy day fund because they wouldn't tap into it or saving their, sending their mother their emergency funds, right? So that they couldn't access it, even if for, for frivolous purpose purchases. We saw a lot of people you know, intentionally introduce, introducing friction when it comes to slow money, which sort of goes counter to what a lot of banks and financial services companies are doing. You and another colleague wrote in an American Banker article that advised companies to steer away from investing their resources in one all-in-one super app that would allow users to access their finances in one place. Why might it be a good moment to reevaluate that super app goal? The ambition of a super app as a standalone thing isn't necessarily flawed. I think the way in which people are designing for a super app is the underlying issue to solve if a super app is to be successful is to tap into what's the ultimate core social purpose these apps are providing. And I think the issue that we've seen with super apps is assuming that a single design ethos and or principle can be placed on something like payments, with something like investing, with something like teaching your kids financial literacy. And we would argue that that's not true, right? There are, you have to create spaces that allow people to interact with those different kinds of money differently because you may not want to check 
your Robinhood app every single day, but you might be tapping into that Venmo and wanting the confirmation that your money was sent seamlessly with ease to your babysitter on a daily basis. And so our argument is you're going to design the super app. Think about all the ways in which those connection points between fast and slow money are useful and design for that because that's what's going to be differentiated. You know, I think in our research, the people that have done this best is people who tap into a group of people who have a set shared common needs. You know, Walmart is is building, is, is going deep into the world of financial services as they are in terms of health benefits and other things, right? So they're creating a world where they understand the Walmart employee, their customers, and what are the ways in which we need to help better prepare them for financial insecurity moments, perhaps, benefits, programs, helping them save more and be smart with sort of their paycheck. And they're being smart about what is the underlying thing we're trying to solve for, as opposed to just having more features for the sake of having more features and driving engagement. Thinking about the idea of the super app and all these apps that are on my phone and honing in a little bit on Robinhood, because it's been such a big part of the 2021 story that we're about to leave in the rearview mirror. We saw its IPO. We've seen some of the issues that it's raised, but that paper that you and your colleague did in American Banker talked a lot about this increase in gamification, the design trend that turns these digital products, financial products into something that you might describe as fun. And it's been used commonly in these fast money applications and sometimes to the detriment of the user, as we've saw and seen with some of those Robinhood examples. But is there a value in the gamification of slow money? And is that possible? Absolutely. I think there's tremendous value in the gamification of slow money if done right. So for example, I think when you think about the retirement and savings crisis we're in, half of this country doesn't have enough retirement savings. There's many young people today who don't really understand the steps for savings. And a lot of our research has shown it's because we're all human. We prioritize short-term benefit over long-term gain, how can we gamify? How can we make it fun and give people sort of the tangible rewards for medium to long-term savings? You know, whether that's through visual features that give them points or rewards or affirmation with their friends or their community that says, okay, I set these goals and I'm going to have an accountability partner that keeps me on track with these goals. Those are the kinds of gamification features for good that we think can be useful with slow money products. In the world of investing as well, I think you can create sandbox environments that can get people comfortable with safe investing, scenario planning about what it could have looked like. And I know that this is something that that you all with EverFi have been involved with. How can we do that with kids and create sort of this, those sandbox, sandbox environments? I think there's absolutely a world for doing that to, to make slow money decisions less opaque also. Right. How, I think it requires sort of a little bit more transparency, less opaqueness, breaking down the steps of how you save, when you save, what are the right moments to engage in, in different kinds of financial products when it comes to your slow money so that people can engage with that now when it matters and take advantage of sort of the powers of compound interest. As we head into the break, you've mentioned half of Americans don't have enough saved for retirement or haven't begun to save for retirement. As people are sort of pondering this and thinking about it as a study companion for the rest of our conversation, where do you recommend they turn to improve their own financial literacy? You know, I'll tell you where people that we've met with are turning to. A lot of people have yet to find a home in digital advice. You know, when we've done studies, it is finding a right financial advisor who understands me and my experience And that is critically important, understands my career, my career directory, how, what matters to me personally and my values in terms of I am someone I'm going to take care of my parents in old age. I need to keep that in mind. So someone who really taps into your values and whether people are finding that in a person or for some of the young people we've met are finding that on TikTok. Now, this is not a recommendation to go on TikTok, but it's, it's sort of that feeling of being seen and meeting someone who understands my values and then who's able to give me sort of the tips and tricks and break it down in terms of the rules of thumb is what we're seeing a lot of people seeing resonate with a lot of people when it comes to financial advice. 
After the break, Millie Aurora, managing partner of Red Associates and I are going to dive a little deeper into how different generations approach finance, the value of trust, and the future. And that's all coming up right after this. India has one of the strongest and fastest growing economies in the world. With a population of 1.4 billion, making energy secure, affordable, and sustainable is essential in supporting its growth. In response, the Indian government aims to diversify its energy mix, increasing its natural gas consumption to 15% by 2030. Efficient to transport, liquefied natural gas is critical in supporting countries with developing infrastructure. ICE's West India Marker LNG Futures contract complements our global natural gas complex, providing essential risk management as demand for liquefied natural gas in India and the Middle East grows. Welcome back. Before the break, Millie Aurora, the managing partner of Red Associates, and I were discussing her career, her team at Red Associates, and the value of the social sciences in understanding and describing the world. Millie, on a recent Cheddar appearance, you spoke about how different generations interact with money differently based on a study completed by Red. Can you walk us through some of the findings behind that research? And does it mean that financial services need to change their approach to all these apps that I have and how they market to a 27-year-old or a 21-year-old? I would argue that, you know, the work that we did uh, on that foundational study with Gen Z that you're referring to now a couple years ago, we're seeing a lot of those findings play out across the general population. And I would say young people are very pragmatic when it comes to their money and very deliberate when it comes to making decisions about their money. They are growing up, you know, the oldest side of, of Gen Z still scarred from the financial crisis or many people today have seen parents go through hardship and they don't want to fall into the same trap. And they're, so they're starting to think long-term, but they don't know how. I will say that the other thing that is affecting how young people are thinking about their money is the changing nature of work. People are, you know, this trend was happening pre-COVID. It is only accelerated because of COVID, thinking about what will my career look like? What, is there such thing as a traditional career anymore? And I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. You're going to see some people who, because of all of the economic uncertainty on the world, want to go back to the big corporation that can provide for me and my family and give me a stable career. And you're absolutely seeing many employers, PayPal, Chobani and others lining up to really ramp up their ways in which they support their employees around financial wellness, which I think is fantastic. And young people are looking for that. At the same time, you have another generation, a, a sort of another segment of young people that are really interested in making it on their own, but not really sure just yet how they're gonna make it work for the long term. And so whether that's the rise of the gig economy, freelancer economy, people trying to start up their own businesses, a lot of people have the ambition to do that because it's very practical, you can see sort of the, the easy returns coming to you. It's sort of, I can make money for myself and only myself kind of logic. At the same time, there's this underlying fear and anxiety of, will I ever have enough for what I need in the long term? And I think when it comes to sort of how banks and other financial services providers need to think about young people today and how to best support them, it is over helping them with this, this big question around financial security and stability. That is the biggest unmet need challenge question that young people, and I would say the vast majority of Americans are grappling with. What is enough? How will I deal with future economic challenges, whether it's inflation or another pandemic, job security, piecing together a career? And they're not sure who to turn to advice. So I think bank, there is a big opportunity because, you know, the other side of this equation is there is a, a trust in institutions is at an all time low trust in governments, trust in healthcare institutions, trust in traditional markers of institution. But at the same time, people are leaning in a little bit more to businesses as a valid source of information. And so I do think that there's an opportunity to build that trust if you can lean into helping consumers think about what are the concrete action scenarios and pathways for me to understand what lies ahead and how I can build up my financial security. If you can speak to those realities and values, 
really understand people for who they are and those emotional fears they have, right? Whether it's sort of an adverse fear to debt or a need to, yes, I want to build financial independence and autonomy for me. And I want to take care of my parents, but I need to create some boundaries. How can you help me do that? Right. So personalized advice that sort of overcomes a lot of the obligations and, and fears that people have. And then the last thing I will say is sort of it, it's part and parcel with stability, but also providing financial security. And this is where a lot of banks and folks that you know traditionally provide financial advice do so reactively. But how can you be one step ahead, checking mm-hmm. in on financial health? giving people a sense of, am I on track? Sadly, it's not something people think about until they're in trouble. And it's not something people proactively want to talk about because again, money, most people have an irrational fear of money and don't want to talk about it. So how can you create lightweight ways of giving people a signal on if they're on track or not, or what are the next steps to help them get on track? Millie, my kids uh, would generally fall into the category of Gen Z, as do the kids of my friends. And my kids have not grown up as gamers, but but others have become, you know, really avid gamers in this Gen Z cohort among my friend group in New York City. And, you know, we've seen that go from original gaming to increased participation in financial markets. And in January, we saw market participants eagerly pile into specific names. And and Red was doing some work with Jigsaw, an alphabet company, on what tendies are and what makes trolls tick. And I certainly learned what tendies are this summer. Can you share what you learned through the process? We have a long starting partnership with Jigsaw, um, as you mentioned, an alphabet company to help them think about ways to mitigate sort of harms on the internet. And one of the things that we looked into is sort of trolling communities and and what drives that kind of behavior. And, you know, one of the things that we found, which we think has implications for the world of investing, as we saw with sort of GameStop and the rise of meme stocks, is that there is a culture of how kids today communicate online, how they sort of trade jokes online that, you know, we, we called it, it's all about the lulls, right? That people are cracking jokes, making fun of each other, really to sort of poke and stoke a reaction from people. And we saw a lot of that kind of behavior happening with GameStop. And whether it's sort of, if you looked at the Reddit forums and so on, it was really people who had grown up on these gaming forums, translating that to the world of investing. And so, you know, for us, it's it's this call to not just the tech firms that need to be thinking about this, but how are the modes and norms of interactions in online games, even if it's sort of in a fringe group, how is that gonna go mainstream? And what does that mean for financial services companies or other brands around, how do you mitigate for that? How do you make sure real world harm doesn't happen because the group dynamics are the way that sort of that's how momentum is built. We've seen public trust Millie, in institutions come to an all time low in recent years, even before the pandemic, the Pew Research Center reported earlier that there was really little change in public trust in government, but that people still believe that government has a responsibility to provide support and services for all Americans. How does this impact how people engage with money and financial institutions, you think? I think that the stark reality that we're seeing is people aren't looking to traditional sources for advice any longer. They're trying to piece it together themselves. I mentioned the the rise of sort of TikTok and financial influencers. In many of our studies, we see people turning, young people in particular, digitally savvy, young people turning to fit influencers who look like them, who can speak to their life story because it's easy, it's accessible, it's engaging. There are clear next steps for what I need to do when it comes to savings. It makes the opaque rules of the financial industry clearer to them. And I think what this means for the financial services industry is we need to lean into language to discourse about what, what how can we make it less opaque? Jillian Tett is someone else you had on your show yep. a little while ago, and she talks about the tribe of investment bankers, where if you go into a room and you spend time with investment bankers, there's a language to how people communicate there. That is a language that is not accessible to the average everyday person. In our studies with with teachers in in, in sort of middle America, 
there are people who like to follow the rules, who like to follow the rules of the games, and they're afraid they're going to get it wrong. So how can we, as financial services companies that are still trusted, I think, in the, in the realm of financial advice, break down specifically what are the tactical actions people need to do? What are those rules of thumb? And I think it's building trust in that way, building trust in showcasing how you understand them. Uh, you know, I can't tell you in how many of our studies we'll have, we'll meet someone who's been a longstanding customer of you name it, bank, take your pick. And they walk into a bank branch or pick up the phone to try to ask a simple question about, you know, what kind of size loan might they qualify for? Cause they're thinking about buying a home for the next, in, in the next two years. And they have to start from ground zero. They have to share their whole life history. It feels very depersonal. It feels like I've been a loyal customer for many, many years and you still don't understand who I am. So how can we, how can we change that equation? How can we as banks show up in a more personal way? How can we again, give them those concrete actions? Uh, and how can we more proactively check in to show that we're on their side, not only when it's too late? We've also seen in recent years in light of Black Lives Matter and other social movements that companies really are figuring out whether or not they can still afford to be neutral on social issues, Millie. Mm -hmm. What does your research suggest CEOs and other businesses really need to do, especially since so often they seem to be in this difficult bind when it comes to balancing the wishes of shareholders versus stakeholders. What advice do you have for these leaders when you're in the boardroom with them? I would say that, you know, making a positive impact on society and that desire to make a positive impact on society isn't something that's it's not necessarily new, but for the most part, these activities has, have lived out of sort of the core business, right? The, you know, they've either, either lived in CSR groups and so on. And I think what's new is that they're CEOs are asking the, the really difficult questions about how can we be a force for good and leverage that force for good as a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis our peers. And I think our response to a lot of the CEOs that we work with is you need to do it with a thought through, sincere, authentic intent, and a serious look at what are the key pillars underneath sort of the movements that your customers care about and, and, and respond to that, right? So it's not enough to sort of do some, do some philanthropic initiatives on the side. If you don't look, about, look at sort of if core sustainability is what you're after, how do you do that in the heart of the business? So I think we really think there's an opportunity to understand it holistically in terms of let's look at your customers. What do they care about? What, why are certain causes important for the, the groups of customers you serve versus others? Let's look at you, your employer base, which is another important stakeholder in terms of thinking about the purpose that motivates your employees. And so our advice to, to CEOs is to not rush into any one thing just to say you're doing one thing. Too many companies have been attacked for greenwashing, for all sorts of things that it's just, we want to do, invest in ESG and sustainability, but really it's not fundamental how to how we think about the core business. If you were going to make a massive bet, think about it holistic, holistically. Think about what you as a leadership believes in. Think about how it impacts your employer, employees. And also think about what are the commercial underlying drivers around sort of your core customers and how they engage with you and how fundamentally making this bet around social impact, sustainability, whatever cause you choose, choose will make it a differentiator for you as a brand. Reflecting on where we are right now in terms of the holidays and looking forward to the next year, you and several colleagues partnered and wrote an article for Slate about how to talk to QAnon loved ones during Thanksgiving. And well, this episode is going to be released in early 2022. There's a lot of advice in that article that's timeless. How do social scientists approach engaging with people who hold different ideas like this? And what led you to write the piece? I think there's a lot of just general life lessons for how in today's society with increased polarization, people with different views, how we can engage with people who disagree with us. And I'll just say, you know, some of those are, are what we live day to day, I hope, um, when red is at its best of being empathetic, not leading with an opinion, but understanding how and why someone might think what they do. 
and coming at that pers- opinion and that coming coming to that discussion with empathy. All too often, what we find, you know, and what we found with that QAnon work or people who disagree is there's a lot of othering going on, trying to say, you know, well, that's just wrong. That has to be false. Downplaying people's own perspective for how and why they might have gotten to a certain opinion. And that article points to tactics to how to engage in a real discussion. Let's think about well, how did you first hear about something like that? Let's have a real discussion because too often we're getting parked into our silos further, further away from each other. And if, and if we continue to down that track, <laughs> I don't know where we're going to be on the other side of the holidays. So I think approaching conversations with empathy, curiosity, as we would any family member, I think is an important life lesson I hope everyone brings, not just into the holidays, but sort of on a day-to-day basis. Millie Aurora, we've covered a lot of ground here, talked about the consulting model, the types of people that you are bringing into the firm, your own history. As we get ready to, to finish up this, let's let's put back on the hat of, of the consultant and see how it kind of affects your everyday life. The Wall Street Journal published an article about how many consultants are spending so much more time at home than they had for the majority of their careers, the old Monday through Thursday on the road and Friday to do paperwork and, and took to... Instead, with all this extra time, they're not traveling, optimizing their times at home. They'd spend time rearranging furniture, finding more efficient ways to do the dishes, organizing weddings or photo albums. Do you relate to these stories? And and as many of us hunker down for another variant, are there any projects that you're now looking to tackle? I find it interesting that amidst all this, you know, I can relate a little bit, but not so much because at Red, we have a different model. You know, we've always had, I'd say, the luxury of time to go deep into to clients and projects. It's a gift and it's a gift that we try to bring our clients that let's slow down for a little bit before we sort of speed up the process around product innovation. Let's think deeply for a little while. And what I think is interesting as we sort of hunker down and the the time that we're in is we are facing a crisis of, of loneliness. Yes, people are hunkering down and finding new home projects and so on. Yet people are doing that alone even as digital communication and find there's more ways to come together online. And I would just urge people to find a way to meaningfully connect, you know, whether that's through, you know, I have a love of books. I plan to to hunker down and dive deep into some books um, that have been on my reading list for quite some time. I'm reading a book on the loneliness generation topic as we speak that's on my docket loon shots is on my docket it's been on my docket for quite some time so i have a few that have been piling up and and then also some good fiction books well excellent i'll, I'll let you get back to the uh yeah. the books sitting on the reading table and thanks very much for joining us inside the ice house thank you so much that's our conversation for this week our guest was millie aurora managing partner of red associates if you like what you heard Please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Stefan Capriel with production assistance from Pete Ash, Ken Abel, and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 